Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, virtually here this evening on Zoom or on YouTube, either in the present or in the future, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel later on. My name is John Taves, and uh, tonight we're broadcasting from Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'd like to um, offer a great uh, thanks to Great Plains Publications for helping to organize this event and, of course, for publishing the book we are here this evening to celebrate. Though I'm sad that we can't be uh, present together in person, this is the next best thing and also allows any number of guests to join us from across the country. So we're very excited to get this evening underway. We are here tonight to celebrate the publication of The Lesser Known, A History of Oddities from the Heart of the Continent by Darren Bernhardt. Uh, Darren will be out in just a moment, uh, but I just wanted to go over the format of the evening very quickly before we get started. Uh, so there is a chat. Feel free to uh, chat amongst yourselves over the course of the evening. If uh, you have any questions for Darren, um, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, and uh, your host will uh, ask those. Uh, so if you would like to interrogate Darren about anything at all, please feel free to just write it into the Q&A box, which is just at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, rest assured, you will not interrupt the event if you um, do ask a question at any point, and then we'll get to those questions as time permits in the future. But first, I wanted to introduce tonight's host before I disappear for the evening. Uh, each week on CBC Radio 1's Now or Never, host Trevor Deneen and his co-host E.P. Juatelu meet people on personal missions to make real change, big or small. Now or Never is heard nationally on CBC Radio on Saturdays. When he's not live on air, Trevor's bringing the laughs on Twitter and settling into a fun chapter in life as a new dad. Please join me in virtually welcoming, to my left, Trevor Deneen. Thanks so much, John. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm uh, I'm coming at you from the most illustrious place any person can come from, the spare basement bedroom of my home to keep my children out. But it doesn't dampen uh, why I'm here tonight because I'm so excited to be here to talk about uh, Darren Bernhardt's new book, The Lesser Known, A History of Oddities from the Heart of the Continent. And anyone who has ever lived in Winnipeg will absolutely love what this book gives you because it is a bunch of stories that you may not have heard, um, pieces of the past that you may not know about. And it's all done with the most beautiful archive photos as well. And the person who put this entire book together is a dear friend of mine who I worked with for many years, uh, Darren. And he was born and raised here in Winnipeg and he's been writing for as long as he can basically remember. His parents remember him doing doodles all the time and trying to write words even before he could. And as he continued to grow up in life, that just continued to, to evolve and he just continued doodling and drawing and, and writing and uh, it served him well in his life because he is now a, a journalist that works over at the CBC writing stories about the little fun uh, details and the little fun uh, things that happen across the city the oddities that happen throughout Winnipeg and certain words have been used to describe Darren uh, by many people that we know uh, kind generous giving funny passionate ageless but it's so nice to be able to add the word author to it as well. So uh, Darren, welcome, my friend. Thank you, Trevor. That was very it, kind. How does it feel, though, to be able to say author now, like to actually say it? Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like a, an elevated uh, or one rung up from being writer, because it took me a long time to be convinced that I was a writer, mm -hmm. even though, you know, like I'm going on to 23 years now of being in journalism. But author has, has, has that other sort of... It know, really you know. does. And it suits you well. It suits you really well. Thank you. I'm sitting here. I got your book. I'm going to hold it up here because yes. uh, I've read this page to page. And I've been trying to figure out the best way to describe it for people. And this is what I've come up with. <clears throat> it's that in life for me, uh, anything that I've fallen in love with, I, I tend to do a deep dive on. Whether it be if it's a musician, I will go back and find the entire back catalog of that musician and try and, and listen to it all. Whether it's uh, an actor, I will watch the whole movie history of that, of that actor. And for some reason, when it comes to my city, a city that I love, mm -hmm. I've never gone back and tried to figure out all the things that kind of made that city be. And I feel like the stories you tell in your book, it's like those B-sides and those deep cuts you find on like an, an amazing band or an amazing group that you love. And they're these gems that you didn't know existed, but when you find them out, 
it just makes it glow that much more and it makes it come to life that much more. So did it feel that way when you were making it? Yeah, you know what? I'm so happy to hear you say that because my intention with this was, it was a bit selfish. I love writing these stories. I love to find quirky stories and, and would pitch them for CBC. And that's how kind of caught Great Plains attention for to, to, to do a collection of them for a book. Um, so to be able to do that and put what I love in a book that other people have the same response to is fantastic. And yes, you're right. It was, it's like discovering these, these, um, these gems. I would go in and find a few stories that I knew I wanted to do. And inevitably it would turn into, as you, as you started to, to go through the layers of, of researching that story, it would come up with stories within stories. You know, you'd find little quirky things that were so wonderful to include, but it was within the larger story. And it was just, there's just this, this, I hope when people read it, they come across and they go, no way, I didn't know that, or this is fantastic. And what I want is for them to be able to afterwards be, be traveling through their city and seeing these places that they're used to um, with new eyes, being able to, to look at that and going, hey, you, you know what used to be there? You know, I read about mm -hmm. this in this book or, so I, I, yeah, I feel like it's one of those things that started off with a certain intent and has grown and blossomed in its own and became, yeah, like these, these, these gems that you didn't expect that you discover on, on the B side. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because it was, when I was reading the book, uh, I think my wife was kind of like, I have to read this book because every two seconds I was like, honey, did you know, honey, <laughs> did you, did you know about this? And it just kept happening throughout the entire book because you, I've lived here my literally 42 years now. And there, I don't think there was a single thing in the book that I was aware of beforehand. And so it was, it was such a, a treat like that. What surprised you? Was there any surprises that popped out at you when you were putting the book together? Every single story. I think when I was writing something, I'd run down the stairs and I'd tell Jen, um, you won't believe this. I'm doing this story and this comes out of it. Or I'm doing this story and this comes out of it. So for instance, um, I wanted to do a story just on, on corduroy roads, these, these oddball, um, roads made out of, of trees, trunks of trees laid side by side, more, primarily through bog areas, you know, where these wagon carts would, would sink. So they make these rudimentary roads. Um, I just thought, what if pe some people know, I know one of those people that know that, but not everybody. So I thought, oh, I'll check into that. Turns out one of the biggest ones was the Dawson Trail that, you know, led from, helped people travel the first time from um, Ontario to Manitoba. And it kind of cut through um, Lake of the Woods area with, in combination with boat travel, but the Dawson Trail did that. Well, so I'm, I'm doing the story about this Dawson Trail, this key component. I'm like, wow, this is excellent. And it turns out there's this rumor of lost treasure along there because you can imagine these carts just bouncing like crazy. And there's some mm -hmm. stories from diaries that people wrote about uh, traveling on these roads, but things bounced out. There's apparently like a cannon, $10,000 in gold that were meant to pay for the Wolseley expedition, um, that the Wolseley expedition is what came here to, to confront Riel when he took over the upper Fort Gary. Um, legend has it, those, that treasure is still buried around there somewhere. Um, and then it turns out, I'm thinking that's just, that's good. But then it turns out that these are making a comeback. In some marshlands, they're finding that corduroy roads are way better environmentally because they allow water to to, to, to still pass through. And if you block it, other roads will become like dams and they, they destroy the, 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 um, the, the nutrients that need to flow together. So it, they're thinking that corduroy roads might help the health of uh, Lake Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's neat that some things come full circle. The other one, and this is what I wanna read from and I'll do this right away is um, uh, the mini golf story and that was one of my was, favorite stories it literally was like there was a whole bunch but that one just like took me aback uh, because i was just like we're talking about mini golf and then we're throwing in like the fbi most wanted we're throwing in like like crime embezzlement like so many different things on mini golf exactly like this is what i'm saying I'm, i found a couple of photos i thought i grew up in in the east cologne in you know elmwood area and i saw this picture of this miniature golf course and went that's where that was on the corner of Henderson and, and Hazeldale. And um, 
I didn't know that. And, and then the more I looked into it, I found miniature golf courses along court and in other places downtown. I'm thinking, this would be neat. People just think it's neat that there was miniature golf courses in these different places. Yeah. And then it turns out, oh, the guy that brought the very first co course to Winnipeg was, you know, his history is being a, a kidnapper and being among the FBI's most wanted. You know, and, and this guy tossing money around and Mr. Big Spender because mini golf apparently brought in a lot of money. But mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. And let, let me read from that one. Okay, please, please. So this is this is uh, I can bring it up here. This is the mini golf mobster Vern Sankey. A game most people associate with the farce and frustration of putting a ball through loop de loops, tunnels and tubes in a clown's face has a more ominous link in Winnipeg. Miniature golf was introduced to the city by a businessman most described as jovial and generous, invariably wearing a grin as he routinely dropped $5 and $10 tips to bellboys, chambermaids, bartenders, and servers. But Vern Sankey was also a bootlegger, a bank robber, and one of the most notorious kidnappers in the United States, where he was considered by the FBI as public enemy number one. Miniature golf had become a sudden novelty in North America as the 1930s dawned, and Sankey, who had been visiting the city in 1929, saw an opportunity. In July 1930, he leased vacant land and opened the Gilly Golf Course between Balmoral and Colony Streets on what today is a parking lot for Canada Life. It was set up next to the Winnipeg Amphitheater Skating Rink, just north of the Granite Curling Club, and adjacent to what would in 1932 become Osborne Stadium the Blue Bombers' first home, making the area a sports and recreation hub. Once Sankey's course opened, he set off a craze in the area, Timothy Bjorkman wrote in his book, Burn Sankey, America's First Public Enemy. To capitalize, Sankey set up Gilly Course Number 2 on Portage Avenue near Maryland Street. Other entrepreneurs soon jumped on the trend, buying empty lots or renting vacant ones from the city to set up their own links. So a little bit of background on, on Sankey. Born in Iowa in 1891, Sankey grew up in South Dakota where he worked as a farmhand but dreamed of working on the rails as a train engineer. In 1914, he married Fern Young and the couple moved to Saskatchewan, joining other settlers flooding into the Canadian West. Sankey was lured by the chance to fulfill his dream. Railroad companies were scrambling to build tracks and offering plenty of jobs. When the couple left, the editor of the newspaper in Wilmot, South Dakota, wrote a farewell saying, we have yet to meet a man who did not say he liked Vern Sankey and enjoyed his friendship and company. The couple landed in Melville, where Sankey got on with the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway, its main line from Winnipeg through Melville, Edmonton, Jasper, and on to Prince Rupert had just opened, and Sankey began as a watchman in the Melville yards. It wasn't long before he was promoted onto the trains, feeding coal into the locomotive firebox. Over the next five years, Sankey built a solid reputation and worked his way to engineer. By 1923, the operations of the GTP were taken over by the federal government and fell under the umbrella of the Canadian Northern Railway. Sankey began to work on different routes and passed time by reading true crime magazines, which helped wet and elicit thirst. Prohibition had made booze illegal in the US in 1920 and Sankey took advantage. When he was on routes that went across the American border, he carried whiskey and found receptive customers. He made substantial money and spent it lavishly on himself and Fern, buying expensive clothes, jewelry, and cars, and traveling and staying at luxurious resorts. He also tipped big and won many friends with his generosity and Midwestern charm. Sankey fell deeply in love with the money, but he also gambled a lot and lost a lot, so he became dependent on his bootlegging profits. Anytime there was a long break in his southbound train runs, he would instead drive a car across the border. He used a ramshackle one and passed himself off as a railroad man heading to his farm for respite. Meanwhile, the compartment under the back seat was filled with a case of booze that earned Sankey about $3,000 or $45,000 today. He began taking long absences from the rail to make more road trips, which gave him freedom to visit more towns, including towns in Minnesota, Michigan, Wyoming, Colorado, North and South Dakota, and he started traveling to Winnipeg the country's fourth largest city to tap into the money flowing there. He ran poker games and gambled on billiards and he set up the mini golf business as well as set up a side relationship with a young waitress at the Silver Slipper Cafe on Fort Street. 
Sankey's rum running slowed in the 1930s as organized mobsters took more control of the trade and ran him out. So he turned to another quick money scheme, robbing banks. In 1931, a train to re he took a train to Regina and robbed the Royal Bank on Albert Street of 13,000. A month later, he and Fern left Canada and returned to South Dakota where they bought land. The ever charismatic Sankey endeared himself to the people in his new community, attending church services and taking part in barn dances and other events. But as most people struggled through depression, the Sankeys built a house, started a farm and ranch, and purchased a new car with a big V8 engine, which would come in handy for Sankey later. Some people wondered about Sankey's source of money, but he had shrewdly won enough friends to have pol most politely ignore it. If he felt he needed, sorry about that, if he felt he needed to explain, Sankey claimed it was from gambling. In 1932, his hunger for more money deepened and his criminal ways turned darker. The crime of the century had just taken place in March, the kidnapping of 20-month-old Charles Lindbergh Jr., the child of aviator Charles Lindbergh and Anne Morrow Lindbergh. The child was taken by someone who scaled a ladder into the nursery of the Lindbergh's New Jersey home. The ransom was $70,000. That kind of cash raised Sankey's eyebrows and ambitions. He decided to give kidnapping a try, but needed help. He made his way to Winnipeg and looked up former railroading friends Gordon Alcorn and Ray Robinson. Both were out of work and seeking jobs in the big city. Sankey rented a hotel room for a week and tried to convince them to help him kidnap someone in the city. He had some prospects and even looked into renting a house to hold the victim. Neither Alcorn or Robinson were quite ready for that and turned him down. Sankey drove back to South Dakota, but the idea only grew stronger for him and he came up with a plan to rope in his accomplices. He sent them letters offering work on the farm. The invite was also open to Arthur Youngberg, another rail pal. They accepted and Sankey drove to pick them up. He spent time planting the kidnapping idea in their heads and by summer, the ransom scheme was back on the table. On June 30th, they abducted 20 year old Haskell Bond, son of a millionaire refrigerator manufacturer in Minnesota. Bond was in his garage in St. Paul about to get into his car when Sankey and Alcorn thrust their guns into his back. He was ordered into a waiting car in the alley. Bond was held for six days in the basement of a rented Minneapolis home as Sankey demanded $35,000 for his release. In the end, Sankey settled for $12,000 and set Bond free in a rural area outside Minneapolis. Four months later, the hunger for a bigger payment gnawed at Sankey. He and the others made a list of potential victims in Denver, a center of affluence. They rented a house and used public records to research the wealth of, of about 30 people. They spent time scouting the properties of their potential targets Asset, assessing the layouts. In the end, the decision was made to go after Charles Boncher, the 32-year-old grandson of Colorado's wealthiest and most prominent industrialist. Around midnight on February 12, 1933, Sankey and Alcorn hid in the shadows of off the driveway, waiting for Boncher. When his car pulled in, they came out with guns drawn. They forced Boncher into a waiting car, handed his wife a ransom note for $60,000 and drove, Sankey's, drove to Sankey's isolated farmhouse where Botcher was held in the basement. And just That's a picture of the, of the farmhouse there. I'm just gonna stop there. Um, the, the story um, you know, goes on to, without giving too much away, <laughs> but goes on there's some money trail to Winnipeg. Um, and of course, all the rail, the rail pals and his connection to Winnipeg um, and, um, the ultimate uh, uh, arrest of Sankey is a bit of a of a nice surprise too. So, um, well, that, while some of those stories have other connections in the states, obviously, um, the connection to Winnipeg is is undeniable. And this is a guy. This is a character who just came up unexpectedly um, in my story, which does go on to talk about all the the goofy miniature golf courses and the funny names they all have and where they all existed. But this was this was a perfect example of of researching and finding layers upon layers that that just make the stories so much more deep 100 it's like it's like it's like story archaeology like you're digging them <laughs> up you're you're dusting them off and you're putting oh, exactly. them all together so we can all enjoy them i think two things uh came up when you were reading that story one is that um i'm never going to be able to sit there and, and put a little ball through a bear's mouth again without thinking about the the horrible man that put this all together and uh <laughs> secondly uh, the photographs that are popping up on screen. Um, the, the other part of this book that I love so much is it's so well written, but the photos, the, the archive photos you use, it, 
that paints a whole different picture of the Winnipeg we've all come to know and love. Yeah, you know, um, being a, you know, okay, just dropping back a bit. <laughs> I'm digressing, which I do a lot in the book. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, I'll start telling a story and go, you know, there's also this. <laughs> it happens, you know, like um, these stories are so fundamentally connected to larger stories. I can't mention some of the early stories without mentioning Riel. The story's not about Louis Riel, but you can't not mention him. So I have to go back and talk a bit about that. One of the stories is about a highway from here to New Orleans. I have to go back and talk about the, the Selkirk settlers because it is, is, it's, it's connected. And so this is what I mean. Not a lot of the stories are just these, these straight linear pieces. They have to, they have to jump back and forth. So, um, so I'm going to as well, but what's that? I was just going to say that what I like that what I, what I noticed is that it feels almost like a Quentin Tarantino movie where it's like <laughs> you start off with the ending, you give us a tease, and then you go all the way back to the beginning and work us the way to show us how we got there. Well, totally. I, I got to hit you right at the beginning. And then while you're there, I'm just like, you know, I've, since I've got you sitting in this chair, I want to tell you all about my life. Um, <laughs> Jen always tells me, you're telling us way too many, too much detail. So um, oh. I've done this in the book instead. Um, but the photo... You know, the, the photos, <laughs> the photos, um, I'm total, total local history nerd. So when I lived in Saskatoon for a long time, um, you know, I'm from Winnipeg, but I lived there for almost a dozen years. And I like to get to know the context of the city where I'm in. So I got to know a lot about Saskatoon just on my own. I'd go visit the local history room, find old pictures and things. I want to know. And I think this is what drove, drove, drives me to these stories is that, um, I think you need to know where we were to understand where we are. You want to know um, the context of our, our built heritage, of our, our, the characters who made our city what they are, to understand a little bit about where we are and, and where things are. I just need to, I want to know the context of the history of the place I'm living in. So I would visit that. So here, being a, like a local history nut, I would, I would just go to the archives and it's open to anybody. You can go to the archives and there's filing cabinets and filing cabinets of, of photos and negatives. And I would just go there and look through them. So that's what I started doing when I put the book together was like, I'm going to make this photo heavy mm -hmm. and then find a little bit of stories to go with it. As I said, I just, a little bit verbose, but I just have to go on to, to, to tell these stories. They're just so fun and fantastic. But yeah, I, I absolutely had to include as many pictures as I can because it's fascinating to look at at the images that are there and anybody can go to the archives and, and thumb through all these files that we have. But um, so, yeah, I've, I've tried to include as, as many as I, as I can, there's gotta be a, close to 200 photos. In there. Yeah, completely. We're going to be opening up questions in, in a little bit for, for anyone who has questions for you. I'm looking forward to see what everyone has to ask you, but before that happens, uh, I'm just going to continue to, to talk to you a little yeah. bit. I'm not ready Let's to talk. let you go at any point Let's in time. Talk. Let's chit chat, my friend. Yes. But uh, you mentioned there about just like looking into the past because as I, I've known you for a long time and, and you're someone who's, who's written many stories about, about the past and, and looking into like old um, crevices and, and cracks and creeks of around the city. What is it though, for you personally, about the, about the past? Like, what what is what does it give to you to discover these things, to find these things? Well, like I, I was saying, I think it's just to know um, where the people that came before us, where where they've walked, you know, what they they're they've left behind, and there's there's clues all around the city to what our past was if you know how to look for it, and. I mean, I th think if you're walking along or driving around and you see something that makes you go, that's weird, like, look into it. I mean, the, the, the thing is, there's the archives have that. And I just want, I, what I ultimately want is people to understand a little bit more of, of, of the environment they, they're in. I think I mentioned this to you the other day, but you know how if you want to you wanna remember to do something uh, or take something to where you're going and you set it out on a table, and after a while, if you don't do it, you stop seeing that thing sitting out there. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way it is if you lived in a city for a long time. You just stop seeing it. You know your routes. You know you're going from A to B, and you know your route there. And there's things along the route, whether it's an empty parking lot, which is one of the stories that I talk about. The first story in the book is at first light. It's an empty parking lot near Portage in Maine. But the significance of that spot is for the first 
electric light bulb in Western Canada went on in a hotel that in that um, it itself ended up having the first billiards in Western Canada, became a, a, a meeting spot for annexationists, um, the site of all kinds of political and, and physical uh, confrontations. And um, then that was torn down and become the McIntyre block, which itself has its own history. But then the McIntyre block got torn down and it's gravel now. And people may pass that by and just go, what a, you know, what a missing uh, spot in the, in the uh, streetscape. But that's a really significant spot. And then there's other things, there's clues all around, like the, uh, the gates on Roslyn. I just, there's the story about the, the house on Roslyn and these gates are there. And I mean, I just wondered what they were because there's not a, a hugely deep lot behind them, but at one time, that lot went to the river. It was about two football fields in length. There were riding trails throughout it. There's a massive mansion on it. There was horse stables. The horse stables now are a, a big, a big building, but they're a completely um, private residence now on, on another street that was eventually developed when that property was all, you know, um, as progress happened. But, and then there's the um, confusion corner, the, the bear pit, there's a little concrete fence there. And that little fence, which is, probably about two and a half, three feet high, is actually the top of what used to be a park that went below the road surface to, designed to let the sound pass over you so it would be like a sort of a, a quiet space, but it got filled in and the community center built there, but that little bit of fence still remains, or the wall still remains that used to be there. So, I mean, this all, this all came to me. I think that the seed of this was planted by my dad who he, he, sometimes when I was a kid, we'd walk in our neighborhood and he'd say, you know, um, this used to be a, a marshy area and then they filled it in and there used to be a creek running through here and these sidewalks used to be wooden planks and stuff. And I thought, this is so cool. Like this whole area seems like it has, I tried to imagine what it looked like at one time. And, um, and so whenever we went places, we'd go down to the exchange and I'd stare at the buildings and just fell in love with the, the way the stair treads were, marble treads were worn in through hundred years of people walking and slowly, you know, eroding the, the stairs. And I just thought of like, what happened? What took place here before over that time? Um, no, I ended up, the creek idea that my dad told me, because with the house we lived in, in I moved when I was two. Um, the house next door to us had a, used to have a creek running through it. And, but years ago they filled it in. That eventually, you know, evolved two years ago um, into a story I did for CBC about all the ghost creeks around the city and how the different, the city could have looked different if we didn't fill these in, if we'd embraced them and used them. But, mm -hmm. um, but so I think a lot of those ideas were planted by my dad when I was a kid. I just love the fact that you as a small child would go into a building and look at old staircases and, <laughs> and see how worn down they are. It just goes to show you like, I missed out on a lot. I was like, give me that Spider-Man comic book now. And you're like, <laughs> what is the wear and tear on these stairs from you generations? Like, like that's just like, that's a mind that works differently. And it's, it's, it's yeah. so wonderful. Do you see it's it in your weird. kids? Now? Do your kids, do your kids have that same like drive to, to, to know the past? And especially now that you know so much about it. Yeah. I, I mean, I think a little bit, cause I, I sort of talk about it a lot when we go places and they're like, yeah, we know. Um, and I realized <laughs> I'm becoming my dad cause my dad on the way home, whenever we would drive home, he'd do a detour, you know, that's where I used to live. And this is where so-and-so used to live. And I'd be like, yes, we know, but, but now I'm, I'm doing the same thing. And so I think, I think, yeah, I think there's a bit of that. Of course, um, it, it's, it's right now to see it. It'll probably be 20 years before it actually starts to, to, mm -hmm. to produce any fruit. But, um, but yeah, it's, um, it's something of, I think when you're passionate about something, people can't help but be a little bit affected by it, you know? Mm -hmm. Is there anything in the city right now that you're curious about that isn't in the book that you're like, oh, if I wrote a second book, that's the first thing I'd be looking into? No, there's nothing I covered. <laughs> covered yeah. it all. <laughs> I'm I've got, uh, as yeah. I'm doing this, I made a list, a list of stories that didn't make the cut. Yeah, there's, there's, there's more. There's oh, some amazing. interesting things out there still too. Yeah. And, and awesome. uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll get the lesser known too at some point. Um, the less lesser known. <laughs> the, <laughs> the lesserest. <laughs> Do you know what? Um, it's funny. I just have to say, I'm so leading up to this event. I was so 
nervous all the time and, and thinking, oh, I got nothing to be nervous about. I don't want to be over prepared. I don't want to, but because there's so much I want to tell about the book mm-hmm. that if I over prepare myself, I'll be saying, oh, I want to say this, I want to say that. So um, I tried not to be, you know, I, I in, in the end, I was a little bit nervous, but you guys didn't know, or you maybe know, but I totally cut myself off from the Zoom as, as John was introducing you. I was like, oh, I'm going to, what, what's this button here? And I went, boom, and everything stopped. So any kind of nerves I had were completely, were completely kicked out by panic. Awesome. And, uh, and then I brought it back up. It, just, it was exactly what I had no nerves anymore. So that was great. Yeah, so, That's good. Yeah. I'm not wearing pants. So this is all good. Like this is, that took me maybe good. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I was, sleep- I was sleeping up until about two minutes before I had to come on here. So I was- <laughs> we have some questions. Uh, a lot of people are popping in with some questions right now. So do you mind if we ask a couple from the, uh, from the people watching? Let's do it. Okay. Uh, Joanne Paulson wrote in and she wrote Darren in big capital letters. How is it possible you haven't aged at all? Which I agree with that. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, except the glasses, obviously. Anyways, how long did the rum running into Winnipeg go on? Well, these? Oh, yeah, those things. Just fake. <laughs> um, just for the book, for the author. Um, uh, the rum running into Winnipeg. Oh, why is the first question have to be something I actually don't know? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I honestly don't know. He, it lasted, he, he did the rum running for starting in about the thirties. And I think it was about 33 that, um, 33, 34, that, uh, organized criminals started to go, you know what, this is our business. So that then they, and he never sort of, he was alone, um, working alone. So once the the organized crime came along, they just kind of kicked him out of it and um he turned mm-hmm. to the uh the, the option of kidnapping so mm-hmm. which organized crime hadn't totally you know um capitalized on yet so she just wrote dang sorry <laughs> <laughs> uh, journalist i wrote i worked with her in saskatoon so uh journalists have, uh, have to ask the questions that you're uh, actually not ready for uh leah sarich wrote in saying darren we studied journalism together how is the writing process different for you when you're writing a book or writing pieces of journalism? Oh, that's a good one. Um, this is all fake. So, <laughs> I can and that's go the end of the stream. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. No, um, uh, it's one thing I found freeing is that I can cite all these other sources. You know, I can do all this research and go, oh, the free press said, oh, this book said. If I was doing journalism, um, you'd have to try to find these sources yourself. So it's almost easier that way. Um, but I also think you're you're not as limited to um, or, or restricted really by the structure of, of of a journalism story. You can have a little bit of of leeway. It's a little more freeing to um, uh, to, to be to write a little more colorful. Um, but there, other than that, there's not a lot of difference. You're you're telling the story in the same sort of um, um, inverted pyramid, you know, the most important stuff at, and, and trailing off and it's, and you're quoting the, and citing people. It's the, it's, it's very much the same, but I feel like it's almost a little more freeing, like you're writing fictional, even though it's not, it, but it, it just has that freedom to, to be able to write um, not according to the structure of, you know, the, the CBC style or anything mm-hmm. like that. Completely. Yeah. Uh, Katie Norberg wrote it and said, having lived here and written this book now, what do you, th- what do you consider to be one of Winnipeg's best kept secrets? Oh, I thought when you first said that Katie lived here and wrote this book, I was like, what? <laughs> no. <Seriously>, plagiarized. <laughs> again, goodbye. Um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> Least kept secret? Best kept secret? Yeah, best kept secret. Um, In your mind, what do you think it is? Mm, that is tough that's like there's so many stories in the book that's like asking me um to 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 pick my uh, my favorite uh child that's the next question actually which i'm gonna do yeah actually. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> but um no there's so many good ones. i mean there's 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 subterranean secrets uh in the city there's some that are just right in your face that you don't know about um honestly i i it 
I don't know what is the best kept secret right now. I keep thinking um, what keeps jumping to me is the, the jail cell. And we've talked about this, but the jail, the, the jail, old jail cell that's underground that was below a, a theater, which was, you know, this family um, theater fun for, you know, it built itself as the, <laughs> little shimmy. Are we doing it this? Are we yeah, let's do this. <laughs> okay, it built cool. itself as uh, this pure family fun place. And below is like this concrete jail where people sat before they were hung because that's also what happened on that spot. So that's the spot where people now go to the Fringe Festival. It's sort of a, a uh, an empty lot that serves as a place where vendors sell or Nuit Blanche, during Nuit Blanche, there's, ev there's events there. Um, it's sort of a gathering place that's really more synonymous right now with with having fun and gathering and and hanging out, but back in the day it was for hanging. Mm -hmm. For so, hanging. Jeez. Well. <laughs> um, <laughs> we also got one from uh, Michael Flores Florizone, and uh, he wrote in saying, "Darren, you're a, you're a brilliant storyteller. How has this inspired you to write your next book? And and what was the biggest struggle about writing this book as well?" Um. Mike, all the way back to BC. I don't know if, if I answer this now, will it get to him an hour later? Because he's in BC. But um, uh, yeah, the, um, the biggest challenge, honestly, was uh, COVID. Because fortunately, I, I, things timed out well. But the archives were all my doing all my research shut down in, in March. I had I was just happened to be done a week before um, they closed up for the lockdown in, in the spring. So if there was anything that I had to get after that, um, I was out of luck. So I had to do a lot of research um, online and, and making a lot of notes about things I need to check in once things reopened and I could access the services again. I got to say though, the people at the archives are amazing every time even though when things did reopen and it was in a limited way, they were just going out of their way to help me. It's, a, it's an amazing um, um, place to, to, to go and just hang out. And, you know, they don't get enough visitors, so you can really get some one-on-one -on -one service when you go there. But, but yeah, I would say this, the, the, the time, this strange year is what played into, into the most, uh, the biggest impediments that I had. But otherwise, um, that and trying to stay awake because I was doing it, after my regular work shift, then I mm -hmm. put in another eight hours doing writing each each day or every couple of days. Well, that's the amazing thing too. I think uh, during this this wild year that we've had and all the changes and adjustments people have had to, had to make, uh, so many people have had to like like take a step back from from things and, and life. And it, uh, it it frustrates me that you just excelled and you were just like, you know what? I'm not going to step back. I'm going to write a book. And, uh, and, then you, and then you did it. And I'm just like, well done, my friend. Well done. <laughs> well, you in a way, like. With the lockdown, you know, um, I had to, not that I'm hugely a, a huge social, socializer, but all family events and gatherings and things were out. So really it opened up the, the time and the day to, to just mm -hmm. knuckle down and do the writing. Do you have the bug now though? Do you, do, do you want to write another one? I want to take a bit of a break. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I would like, there's, like I said, there's, there's a list of stories yet to, to, to go through. Yeah. How long did it take you to write this? Uh, Darius Solomon wanted to know. Ah, uh, it was, uh, so I researched from January to the end of March. So three, three months of research. And then I wrote from uh, end of March until just about the end of May. So, so about three months, but, um, uh, but it was a long, it was long days. It was long days, like finishing up around 12, 31 in the morning and then going to bed and getting up for my, early shift with CBC. So it was, it felt longer than three months. But. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite questions that was just asked and uh, been sitting on it because I really enjoy it. Uh, it says, let's suppose that in addition to a COVID uh, vaccine in 2021, it, all, it also brings us a, a time machine as well. So we get both of these things, which would be a delight, obviously. Uh, to which moment in the lesser known would you, oh. travel, would you travel back to? That is yes, and that was by Corey Wolf. Corey Wolf sent that's that one. Of course, that's Corey's. That's dynamite. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm here. I am looking at my um, table of contents because I'm trying to remember what. Um, you know, there's like some periods you romance, and you go, "Yeah, I'd love to see that" because I wrote about it and I, I was really inspired by it. But 
you realize it'd be incredibly violent. Um, and, <laughs> and, <clears throat> like the, the general strike. I don't want to go and be caught up in the, in the chaos of the general strike in 1919. But I think um, what I would love to do is go back to, um, I think it would be the, the, the again, going back to the, the Bijou, that's the one with the secret jail cell. Now, I'm not going to go back to the time of when they were using the jail cell for, for hanging. But just beyond, after that, it was a jail cell when it was a courthouse courthouse ended up getting torn down and what was built on it was this um, quite a beautiful building and it actually was it was a concave kind of shaped building the front because it was it's at a, an elbow in Main Street so they mm. built it to kind of curve with the curve of the, the street so it had a, a really nice presence on the street and, and a beautiful uh, roof line and stuff but um, there was so much it was the hub of 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 um, entertainment in the city. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a place, this is one of those stories that came up um, unexpectedly, but it's a place where Charlie, or where Groucho Marx, the Marx brothers were in town. They were wandering around. This is what you did. People wandered around downtown Winnipeg, if you can believe it. And they heard laughter. They heard laughter coming from this place. And so Groucho Marx goes in, it's Charlie Chaplin. He said he's never heard people laugh so much when introduced himself to Charlie Chaplin. Like this is where Groucho Marx and Charlie Chaplin met. I mean, wow. I'd love to be around that time, just seeing these. Just sitting in that out. room. Yeah, exactly. Just mm -hmm. watching these, these, you know, now, if I could go back in the time machine, like Corey said, and, but be aware of what I know about them, you know, not mm -hmm. going back to that time and having your mind be that at that time. But yeah. For me, it was that. the, I love the, that. The pine to palm trees. I would love to ride that road. You, you talk about a road in the book that was from from New Orleans straight to Winnipeg. It was the first road that stretched that entire length, and all these dignitaries and people would travel this road. And I don't know. There's just something about being able to just like jump on the highway and just head down to New Orleans like a straight shot, and that was the, the only road that could get you there. Like what a, what, what a wild time that would be. Isn't it crazy? Like that's something we just take for granted. But it was at a time where you're like, well, look at this. This. This is a paved road as opposed to, you know, cow pies and rutted roads where your wooden wheel is going to fly off. Like it was mm -hmm. at a time where people were starting to get, it was just, just before the U S started creating the interstate system. And, mm -hmm. and so it was a combination of these highways, but soon after the interstate system happened and all these ribbons of, of pavement um, were everywhere and people were used to it. But at that time it was a bit of a novelty and they said pine to palm on it just for people to know it was because it connected Winnipeg, so the pine, more of a common tree in the north, to the palm trees in, in New Orleans. And there's this concrete obelisk in, um, in the French Quarter in, in New Orleans that's carved into the concrete, um, Winnipeg. Mm. Yeah. We're running uh, near the end of time, but we have a time for a couple more questions here. So uh, Darius Solomon wrote in, and I like this idea, and I hope you, you really think about it, because she wrote, would you consider running a licensed beer and bike trolley tour of all these places? <laughs> yes, without a doubt. Jen has asked me if I, I should do a walking and reading tour, but she never once mentioned throwing in the bikes and beer. So yeah, that, that, that tips the scales. Uh, Laura Lamont wrote in, hi Darren, thrilled to hear more about the book and looking forward to reading it. What do you think of converting the Bay downtown to an archival hub for the city slash provincial slash HBC archives? What a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, the archives right now, the city's archives are, uh, I should have included where the archives are is in the lesser known. It's down the side street behind, um, off Notre Dame. I, it, it's not, it's not suited for what the archives actually give us. If they could move that um, into the bay, it would be next door to the, where the provincial archives are, bring the huts. Oh man, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Inside this iconic uh, building. And then they should move the CBC into the bay. And then you have these two iconic, Canadian corporations. Let's say. I think we're coming up with great ideas during this. Yeah, we, have time, we have a time machine. We got a beer and bike trolley. We got we moved something in the HBC building. Like we're doing yeah. real good here. I know it's great. <laughs> we're reviving downtown. Um, got a great question from from Abby. It says, "Who is the favorite child, Dad?" <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's uh, huh. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I'm just going to write this out to you, to you only. <laughs> and we'll do we'll do one more we'll do one last one here and uh thank you everyone for writing all your questions there's still a bunch more in here but i know we kind of kind of wind down a bit here but uh just scrolling through um 
Yeah, what were some of your resources? Ali Wauchuk wants to know, what were some of your resources for finding all the information you needed for these stories, these stories and any historians that you want to, to shout out? Because there's a lot of references in your book to a lot of different people. That's it. I'm glad that Ali brought that up. It's um, so primarily um, everything <laughs> online. You know, I, 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 there was a lot of, there's a lot of fantastic books, depending on the era of this, where the story comes from. There is some excellent um, old Winnipeg books that I, I referenced. Um, online, I did a lot of research online, which brought up a lot of, uh, a lot of those books. So I didn't actually physically get them, but I could read them online. Newspaper archives, you can't say enough about newspaper archives. You can go back to, like I was regularly reading the free press from the 1800s. You know I mean? This is, this is there. So I'm reading that, doing some searches with keywords. Um, the archives themselves have excellent um, um, uh, documentation, especially on the Roslyn Road, uh, or sorry, the gates, the, the gates on Roslyn Road. Uh, there's great clippings. Um, a lot of people may not realize this, but when families don't know what to do with these historical documents, um, they get them to the archives, and there's some amazing files um, there that, uh, that that people can can look through. Family letters. Um, uh, just all kinds of different notices and certificates that, that you can piece together. Um, but yeah, some of the, the other historians, I mean, we've got some great ones. Um, Christian Cassidy, if mm -hmm. you look online, he does, um, uh, West End, uh, West End Cassidy, is that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he's got, he's got great stuff all the time. I mean, when I was searching for some Winnipeg history stuff, he, his little nuggets were fantastic. Um, there's also, just the other day, I was looking on Pinterest of all things. Um, there are so many sites for uh, Winnipeg history. It's it's really is incredible. There's some there's some fa fantastic uh, resources out there, and I I just it was like a feast. I just I just I, I, I devoured them all. I think what I what what I've really enjoyed about your book and uh, is that I uh, I've always I've always loved our city. And, and it's a love hate sometimes, obviously, but uh, but deep down there's a there's a deep love for it. But I think after reading your book, uh, I feel more connected to it than than I did before because I think you can only feel connected to something whether whether it's a neighborhood, uh, a city, a community when you when you get to really know the city, the stories, the people that are there. And I think your book has does a really great job of making you know all of those things and learn all those things that, in a manner that really makes you feel like you're part of it. Thank you. Uh, that's what I, I want. I want people to, to be able to see it, as I said earlier, with, with uh, through a new set of eyes. I mean, we know a lot of, a lot of the history that's been often repeated, um, but these are their, their sort of the fringe stories. Um, well, and while many of them are quirky and I have a good laugh at some of them, I mean, there's, I've included, there's been um, the Métis that's, you know, founded Manitoba, went through terrible, terrible times. And there's um, a good chunk of that in, in one of the chapters on the election riots, um, which, I mean, if, if you get a chance, read the election riots and just insert Trump for some of mm -hmm. the, uh, for some of the people in there. It's amazing how some of these stories from over a hundred years ago could just be happening now if we had to if they were in the headlines, the election riots that happened here by some of our founding politicians. Mm -hmm. um, but I, that's why I just, there was, there was some quirky ones, but in, there's some serious ones. I mean, the Métis were, were treated horribly and run out of here when, when um, this flood of, of immigrants from Ontario came when, the, when it, the city started opening up to, or the land started opening up to others um, through immigration. And, and the Métis who, who founded this were, were awful, treated awful because there was a huge anti Louis Riel sentiment out East. And so they came here and, 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 you know, um, without Riel being around, um, the rest of the Métis ended up taking the brunt of that anger. Um, and, and then there's the, the Canada's first black Olympian mm -hmm. from Winnipeg, um, horrible racism that he faced. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's quirky stories, there's things, but there's also, you know, like a, 
a serious side to some of these stories too. That Completely. a lot of shady characters, a lot of shady characters. Very so, shady characters. Like Winnipeg was built on shady characters. That's what you learn about it. They did some amazing things, but shady is all get out. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Like the election rights one. Going back to that, it's I just came across those are pictures I came across at the archives. And I thought, what? What? There was some riots during election. What? What could this be? Led by the man who would become Winnipeg's first mayor and the man who would become the lieutenant governor. They were um, rabble mm-hmm. rousers and, and, yeah. <laughs> and now there's streets and libraries named after them. But. Um, I got to ask one last one because Melanie Verheg uh, sent in a message and, and it, she would get very mad at me if I didn't ask. Uh, <laughs> congrats, Dare. Uh, all the cool people need to know if there's any trans Kona elements in the book. Trans what? <laughs> Mel, oh Mel. There's, um, of course, there's a huge, actually, there's a huge um, character from Transcona, and I thank the Transcona um, his, um, Historical Society, Transcona Museum, for for getting me some um, images from there. But there is in the story about the Magician's Brotherhood, um, Mel uh, McMullen, Mel, Mel. Um, Great guy, great guy connected to Houdini and some of the most famous musicians or magicians we know started this society on the seventh floor of uh, the, the Union Bank building downtown, um, worked in a mailroom. So he used the mailroom to send out his, his um, newsletters from this, this uh, magician society he started. He's from Transcona. He went on to be become very, very uh, uh, well-loved um, member of, of from Transcona and um, this society that he created still exists today. Mm-hmm. Number one published ma- uh, magician magazine in the world today. In the, wor- in the world. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, speaking of amazing, uh, what you did here has been amazing, buddy. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of you for, for what you've done. I'm so excited for uh, for people to be reading this book and it's 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 perfectly in time for the holidays. What a, what a great book to be able to give people. I have a feeling that everyone you know uh, they know what they're getting for Christmas. You're just going to be putting it in everyone's <laughs> stockings and everyone's wrapping it up. It's like, guess what it is? <laughs> My parents are going, hey, when are we going to see a book? I'm just, just wait. <laughs> Four more weeks. Congratulations, my friend, my friend truly. Thanks, Trev. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, can right. I say one thing? No, I we're done. Say, um, we're done. <laughs> wait, come back. <laughs> I have to say, because I would be totally out of place. I want to say it's the beginning, but you know, I, I went off. Um, I want to thank um, Christine Fellows for this wonderful cover art. Um, very good friend, collage um, artist, musician, wonderful person, made this eye-catching cover, which is, I think, a- any bookstore your window you're going to walk by, it's going to grab your attention. I want to thank you, McNally and John, for doing this. Great Plains for having faith in me and um, and the Academy for uh, what's to come. And uh, <laughs> okay. No, but I want to thank, like, there's a lot of people that have, have gone into this and I have a big acknowledgements page at the back, but uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I may have put the words down, but there's a lot of people that helped make this possible. So, mm-hmm. well, thank you very much, my friend. And thank you for doing thank, this. Thank you. Uh, John's going to be coming back in right now with a few extra words for everyone. So please stick around for a few more moments. Hello everyone, I have some exciting procedural details to review here at the end of the event. Uh, So if you would like to purchase a copy of the book, uh, please do feel free to call McNally Robinson. Uh, You can also order online if you are so interested. We have uh, piles and piles of them. And only by purchasing the book will you actually see the image of Mel McMullen and his giant prop banana, which is not a euphemism, and uh, may be found in this book, The Lesser Known. Uh, Thanks again to Great Plains for publishing this wonderful book and helping to put on this evening, uh, particularly Sam, for all their organizational excellence. I'd uh, like to thank Darren Bernhardt, obviously, for writing the book and giving us a reason to uh, gather here virtually this evening. Uh, To Trevor uh, for his inimitable hosting. Thank you kindly, Mr. Deneen. And also to all of you for joining us, for sending through your incredible questions, and uh, for just hanging out with us this evening. It's been a real pleasure. So many thanks to all of you. Have a very, very good night.